Good morning, and uh, thank you all for, for being here. I'm Eric Tannenblatt, uh, and on behalf of my colleagues at McKenna Long and Aldridge, I want to welcome you all uh, here this morning for our um, Corporate Political Activities uh, Seminar. Uh, this is a, a topic that is obviously very important. You all are here because it's a topic uh, of interest, interest to you. Um, I had our firm's government affairs group uh, we have a separate team at uh, McKenna Long and Aldridge, which is our political law team. And that is headed up by Stefan Passantino, who some of you have already met. Um, Stefan, uh, we're, we're glad you're here. Stefan actually is the uh, legal counsel, or general counsel to the Newt Gingrich for President campaign. So he's been very busy of late, but we're glad to, to have him here. Um, we have a separate political law team that is made up of lawyers that have expertise uh, in political law. And I know most of you know what political law is, but it's uh, if you're a business and you interact with the government, uh, there are a number of compliance issues. And that's what the political law team focuses on is compliance issues. And you'll learn a lot more about that. So whether it deals with campaign compliance, lobbying compliance, uh, political law is the, the place you go if you have any questions. And it's also something that uh, changes, as you'll see, regularly. Um, but we have a very distinguished panel to, to kick us off, and, and I'm just going to introduce them and then uh, turn uh, the program over to our moderator. Uh, first, I want to introduce uh, Governor Howard Dean. Uh, Governor Howard Dean is a senior strategic advisor here at McKenna Long and Aldridge. Uh, I know he's a familiar face to most of you. Uh, Governor Dean uh, most recently was the uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, but uh, prior to that had a distinguished career in public service, serving as governor of Vermont for, for 12 years, and during that tenure uh, also chaired the National Governors Association uh, and is a, a physician uh, by training. So prior to public service, he had a a career uh, in medicine. Uh, we then are fortunate to have uh, Michael Steele with us. Michael Steele, uh, currently, uh, we all see him if you watch MSNBC, but he is the uh, former. <laughs> He, he's the, and I yell at you a lot, Michael. On the, I know you do. On the TV. I know you do. Um, but uh, Michael's the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, and uh, before that served as lieutenant governor uh, for the state of Maryland. Uh, in addition to being lieutenant governor, uh, Michael also ran for the United States Senate in Maryland, and I mention that because uh, he had to deal with a lot of the political law issues that we're going to discuss today. So not only did he experience that at the state level as lieutenant governor, but as a candidate, and then also as chairman of the RNC. Michael is a, is a lawyer, um, and so we are very pleased to have him here. And then moderating our panel is Jim Galloway. Uh, Jim Galloway uh, is with the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We were just talking. He's been there for 32 years. Uh, he is their top uh, political reporter, editor, um, runs the a uh, political insider blog and uh, someone who really has a pulse, not just on Georgia politics, but uh, also national politics. So we are really pleased uh, to have Jim with us today. So with that, Jim, I'm going to turn it over to you. It's all mine. All right. All okay. All right. Uh, many thanks, Eric, and uh, to McKenna Long Aldridge for having all of us here. Uh, we've only got 45 minutes or so to drain everything we can out of these two guys. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot here. Uh, and quite frankly, anything I told you about the presidential race today would be wrong by lunchtime. So, I mean, so, uh, I mean, last Thursday, you know, I woke up and I could have sworn that Mitt Romney won Iowa. By nine o'clock, it was a tie. By Friday night, Rick Santorum had, had been declared the winner. And I'm wondering, when did the Talmages move to Des Moines? <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, let's just have a quick, very shallow review here of what's been going on. Uh, first, Iowa, of course. It, and it was very, very hard to understand what was going on into Iowa until you, as a reporter, checked into your hotel room and turned on the TV and you just saw a wall, uh, a wall of TV ads coming at Newt Gingrich. I mean, you could sit there for 15 minutes 
and you can you could watch 13 minutes of attack ads aimed at uh, aimed at Newt. Uh, this is where we uh, we we were introduced to restoring our future. That's the that's the uh, Mitt Romney affiliated, allied. I've got to be careful of my words here. Uh, PAC. Uh, I've got to confess that I skipped New Hampshire, which was where Romney had his second win. And where it became, but well, I've got I've got this written down. Okay, it first is where he had his second win, then became it his first win, but only at when he was going for his third win in South Carolina. That's how that's how confusing this is. Okay, all right, uh, but New Hampshire is where Sheldon uh, Adelson dropped five million on winning our future, which was the Gingrich Pack. Uh, Gingrich held his, his money until South Carolina, of course. Uh, and we had, I think he dropped 3.8 million, uh, winning our future dropped 3.8 million in South Carolina, restoring our future. See, we're not talking about candidates right now. We're talking about uh, super PAC competition. Restoring our future dropped 4.8, and the result was a 24-point turnaround. Uh, Newt had, a, Newt had a, a, a just a wonderful victory. If you're a journalist, this is where the hard search for a metaphor begins. Newt has resurrected himself so many times. You're tempted to call him Bella Lugosi, but that's kind of dated, and 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 you know the Dracula theme just doesn't doesn't work. Freddy Krueger, that's too mean. Jesus Christ, I think would Newt work with Newt. He would be to prove that, but uh, but I'm not sure Santorum would. Uh, okay. We have now moved to our multi-state, first multi-state contest, which is Florida. Uh, uh, I was talking with uh, Randy Evans, who is not here, is he? I hope he's not here, uh, 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 yesterday uh, or Monday. And uh, he said, basically, you've got to, you've, uh, Randy Evans is uh, uh, consigliere for, for, for Gingrich. Uh, but basically, you've got to chop, uh, Florida is, is five states into one. I mean, it's Alabama, it's Atlanta, it's New York, it's Cuba, you know, and a little bit of Kansas thrown in here, <clears throat> thrown in here. And of course, we have got uh, two debates. We have learned that Newt loves to play in front of an audience, and when the audience doesn't play with him, then he doesn't do so well. We've got a second debate coming up, and we've got, what, 10 million? Fifteen million dollars being spent in super PAC money. Uh, don't ask me. Uh, I'm, uh, I think I think the Romney I think the Romney figure I think the Romney figure in Florida is is ten million dollars. Uh, Newt's been given an additional five million, uh, but he's been told to spend it only on positive stuff. I don't know how that's going to work. You're talking about. Super PAC. Yes, super more. Yes, uh, yes, again, super PAC. I'm sorry. Winning our future and restoring doing, our future. Doing a good job here. <laughs> All right. Okay. No coordination. Right. No coordination. Now, now, what we have here, we have we have two gentlemen here who know more about campaign finance than anyone this side of Comedy Central. <laughs> uh, so, so. Uh, Here's my first question, and and first of all, I, I have to explain. This is all Michael Steele's fault. <laughs> yeah. My exhaustion, my lack of a day off. <clears throat> this guy, this guy was in in the spin room, uh, down in uh, was it Tampa? Yeah. Um, on Monday, he's in the spin room saying this presidential race could last until May. He designed it that way. I did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> okay, here, okay, here's my first question. You've had Romney and Gingrich both say, oh, they hate this new system, this the super PAC system. Uh, a candidate ought to be able to control his own message and his own money. Uh, on the Democratic side, we've got uh, there's we were, we're told that 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 President Barack Obama is reluctant to to embrace the super PAC uh, 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 method. But given the fact that we've seen that 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 we we now have a system that provides you instant 
cash, great deals of cash, and allows a candidate to turn on a dime, to turn his fortunes on a dime. I mean, witness Gingrich. Are these guys sincere? I mean, or is this is, is this thing here to stay? Uh, Governor Dean, let's start with you. Um, I think it is here to stay, uh, as long as we have the Supreme Court that we have. Um, I think there will be an attempt at a, at a constitutional amendment, but I don't think it's going to go very far, very fast. Um, and I think it's fundamentally changed politics. I, 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 when this first, when the Citizens United decision came down, I was skeptical because I did not think that big corporations would take the chance on alienating substantial parts of their uh, customers. And that initially that was kind of right. In in 2010, it made a difference, but not an enormous difference. Um, and Target, for example, uh, the chairman wrote a check to a very conservative uh, gubernatorial nominee, and all hell broke loose on the internet, and they apologized and said they weren't going to get back in politics and so forth. So I really thought that, despite the fact that I despise the Citizens United uh, decision and think it has nothing to do with the Constitution, they made the Constitution up in the majority, I think, because nowhere can I find in the Constitution that a corporation is actually a person. I've looked very hard for that. Um, but, you know, so we have judicial activists on the right, as we did for, on the left for a while. Um, but the, the fact is, uh, I didn't think we were going to change things that much, and it's changed things dramatically. I do get some satisfaction in my partisan soul that it's the bitten of the Republicans and the you-know-what first. Um, but I bet you Newt Gingrich doesn't like that, all, all these packs all that much these days. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, tough system. But, you know, once you open the door uh, to influence, it's very hard to shut the door. And just to give a quick um, example of this, Arizona passed a campaign finance law, which was pretty good. And this is a fairly conservative state, as you know. In fact, it was very good. It was public financing of campaigns, didn't shut out uh, public money, but had a, a, a sort of so-called millionaire's amendment, which said that if you if were funding your own race or um, raising private money, the state would add a percentage uh, to the people who were on public financing. And there was a fairly high threshold. You had to get a fairly significant number of people to give you 50 bucks or something like that to prove that you were uh, not just a fluke or somebody who wasn't uh, a serious politician. The uh, it was passed by referendum because the you know there's one party in in the legislatures all over the country and in Congress that's more important than the Democrats and the Republicans. That's the incumbent party. So no incumbent will of e either party will do anything to jeopardize their chances for re-election. Um, and so uh, after it passed, they ran an election under it. It won pretty. It did pretty. They worked pretty well. And then the special interests, i.e. corporations and unions together uh, in the chamber, got together to try to get it off the ballot in a referendum, which was soundly defeated by the public, who does not like what's going on in this country. Um, I feel pretty strongly about this. I think it's the, probably the worst thing that's happened to this country in a long, long time with Citizens United. I think democracy is essentially for sale at this point to the highest bidder, and I think the Republican primary is showing that. When one guy can finance it, and I don't have a dog in the fight, obviously. I think personally think Romney's a tougher candidate for us to beat than, uh, than uh, Gingrich. But um, when one guy can put in $10 million of his own money and bring the supposed nominee of the Republican Party to his knees, I think that's pretty shocking. And that's basically what's happened in, the, in this race. Now, I don't think Romney's on his knees, and I don't think at the, at the end of the day um, uh, you know, one guy's going to make that much difference, but one person who wrote two five million dollar checks has changed the complete completely changed the complexion of the Republican race. And if for some reason Mitt Romney does get the nomination and doesn't win, I think there'll be a lot of Republicans looking back and seeing one person who completely uh, changed the way things were going because the damage that's been done to Romney as a result of this. Mr. Steele. Uh, good morning. It's good to be here. Uh, I, I I have a slightly different perspective <laughs> on all of this. Uh, starting with the fact that when I became chairman of the RNC, we uh, submitted to uh, the Supreme Court a challenge to McCain-Feingold, because that's where all of this really begins. Uh, you know, politicians in Washington are great creatures of habit. Uh, and when you ask them to regulate their habit, uh, you get things like McCain-Feingold and Citizens United. Uh, and, and that is because uh, they, they, they do it halfway. They don't do it the way, as, as the governor just mentioned, in cases like Arizona or in places like uh, Virginia, that have a very open process where there's full disclosure. What really ticks people off, particularly on the left, 
uh, about Citizens United is the non-disclosure provision. Basically, I can write the check and I stand behind the veil of this uh, super PAC entity and not have to disclose who I am, whether I'm an individual or a corporation. Uh, and I think a lot of folks have a problem with that particular aspect of it, but that's because of the way the system um, originally morphed itself coming out of McCain-Feingold. So when we, when I came into office, um, we inst we made a request that the Supreme Court challenged uh, provisions of McCain-Feingold, uh, and our case was the companion case, the sister case to Citizens United quite frankly, where we wanted to take the emphasis away from where it ultimately landed on the corporate side and put it back into the respective parties where it belongs, quite frankly. Uh, prior to McCain-Feingo, all this money that we're seeing floating out here now would have come to the RNC and the DNC, uh, and we would have to have disclosed it under FEC rules, uh, who those donors were, what their addresses were, what they did for a living, et cetera. But because of the system going down this rosy pathway, you had you had a shift away from state uh, and national parties uh, into the private sector, effectively. Um, and the McCain-Feingold uh, setup was such that um, you know I understand the governor's you know concerns about one person writing a check. Well, one person after on the heels of McCain fine go to help the Democrats get themselves reoriented in this new landscape and that was George Soros. So the reality of it is George Soros funded a number of entities uh, on behalf of Democrat interests, liberal interests, that supported the Democratic Party uh, for two or three election cycles. Uh, and so what happens now is this thing gets eroded, uh, eroded in some cases, but it's certainly exposed and you have uh, more people able to play, in this case, corporations, uh, because I guess they're people, and um, <laughs> at least I've been told that. And, and so this is the landscape we're in. Uh, now, I suspect what will likely happen, I, I think there may, I agree with the governor, there, there will probably be some, some failed attempts at some constitutional amendments, but I, I think that uh, despite the ruling of the Supreme Court, uh, the Congress can, and you know, those really smart lawyers up here can can tell me if I'm wrong, uh, can to some degree regulate uh, that behavior to the extent that they can put in provisions that you have to say who you are, you at least disclose it, or, or something like that. I think there's going to be those types of efforts um, to deal with this uh, this particular case because both the right and the left do not like. Uh, this environment, um, largely because, quite honestly, because there's been such a stink from the public. If the public is snoozed through this whole thing, they, they, they would be in party heaven right now because on both sides they have their, their, their corporate interests uh, that now have a playground to play on. And while the Democrats may wail and gnash their teeth over Citizens United, trust me, Barack Obama will take advantage of it reluctantly this fall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he will amass, in, because he wants to amass in some form or fashion, a billion dollar campaign. And trust me, a billion dollars is not going to go through his campaign because of the, the, uh, the campaign li limits. <laughs> I mean, that's a heck of a lot of people to give you money, you know, $2,500 a pop. So let's be in the real world here. So all the gnashing and teeth and throwing stones at Citizens United by the left is fruitless and means nothing because they will play on this playground because it is the playground to play on. And if you want to raise a billion dollars, you're going to go to the George Soros corporate interests and do that. And they're going to write their checks. And we can all sit back and be upset about that. But what it means for you, uh, both as corporate interest and as lawyers who work with and advise those corporate interests, is making sure that you keep it as clean and as I would recommend, as transparent as possible. I think the more people can voluntarily acknowledge this is the contribution I'm making, the less noise you'll find yourselves having to deal with later on. There's no prohibition for you stating up front, I'm giving your your super PAC a million dollars. I mean, we've seen just what's happened with uh, Adelson and his wife in their $5 million. You know, it's like it stops the presses and, and people spend literally 20 minutes on the news talking about it. 
um, that will be old hat by the time we get to September and October. And, and the reality of it is uh, this thing will see to the background somewhat. Uh, and, and those interests out there that want to play on this new playground will do so on both sides. What I find fascinating is that for the first time, um, and I think appropriately and rightly so, Republicans have figured out how to play on this playground. After McCain-Feingold, they just kind of sat there and in typical Republican fashion, we just wanted to litigate the matter. Well, the Democrats were like, okay, you guys go to court. We're going over here and raise the money. And they did. They did. I saw it come into my state in a whole host of ways that we could talk about. Uh, but when I ran for the U.S. Senate, but as adapting to this environment is something that everyone is now going to have to do until, as the governor noted, you either get a, a different Supreme Court, God forbid, or uh, this matter, it gets before the court in such a way that they can deal with it again. Um, just um, to, to, to drive home a point, uh, the Center for Responsive Politics came out with uh, last night with uh, an assessment of how much money has been tossed around in the federal uh, in the federal election system, just in the in the last month up, up until January twenty fourth, forty four million dollars. It's almost twice as much as was tossed around uh, four years ago. Ninety five percent of it is independent expenditures. Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing a lot of checks written now. Uh, Mr. Steele, you brought this up here. Uh, the parties, the national parties, have have traditionally been the recipient of those large checks. If we have super PACs taking these checks, what do we need a national party for? Because you still need someone to go vote and get out that vote on election day. And and this is this is uh, probably one of the uh, the problems. And I warned against this as as chairman because I saw it coming. Not not necessarily in as a result of Citizens United, but the trend lines and the, and the governor uh, actually is is the architect of this trend line, wittingly or, or not, when he, when he, no, but it's a good thing. No, it's actually a good thing because what he figured out, what his team figured out in his presidential run was a way because of the institutional issues he had to deal with inside the Democratic Party at the time, who may not have been a fan of someone like a Governor Howard Dean running for president, just as you have on the right, you know, folks who may not be a fan of, you know, Rick Santorum or Newt Gingrich running for president because they're outside of those traditional institutional doors. He figured out how to take advantage of the Internet. He figured out how to create a financial stream uh, that uh, opened up the process a little bit more. Uh, and that led to a host of other ways to raise money that uh, have become increasingly important, particularly for national parties as major donors who've totally been tapped out, uh, particularly after eight years of a presidency, for example, in the, in the Bush era, where you had folks who came in with Bush 41. Um, by the time you got to the second term of Bush 43, they had been on Air Force. They could, they could give you every nook and cranny of Air Force One. They have, you know, a, a name by the bedpost on, in, in one of the rooms in the White House because they've been there so much. So that doesn't appeal to them anymore. There's no fun in there. There's no juice in that. And so what I saw was this trend line of major donors, those who could write those big checks, which would then cut back from a million dollars to $38,000. All right. Trying to find someplace else to go. Uh, and so as I was coming in the door, a lot of them had already left the RNC. Um, Rove sets up his super PAC and grabs the rest. And so what it forced the party to do was to adapt. And we did. And again, taking a lesson from my colleague here, um, we adapted by building out an infrastructure on the net that would allow us to raise the funds to put those ground troops on the, gr on the, on the ground and to, to make sure you had what the resources were needed for state parties and local parties to run the campaigns. The problem with the super PACs is, that, and, and it's an interesting point um, that I think we're going to have to watch very closely, the problem that they have on the surface is that they can't do what Howard and I did as national chairman. And that is organize, develop lists, make the phone calls, voter vaults, all the things, the tools that are necessary 
for a candidate to actually win. Their dollars are largely for TV. G Governor Dean, the Democratic side, are we, are we seeing the end of the DNC here? No, I, I don't think so. Although I will point out that I thought it was great. I thought McCain Feingold was great. And the reason is uh, we had a huge donor to the DNC the year, I mean, the cycle before I got there, who'd given us in the multi million dollars. I never talked to him once. I thought he was a bad guy, and I knew he wanted influence for his money. And I didn't have to talk to him, because instead of giving us $6 million, he could only give me 38000 And that wasn't much, considering I was amassing hundreds and hundreds of $38,000 so, uh, contributions. So I think McCain-Feingold was actually a great bill, because when you limit the donations, you limit the importance of any particular donor, and you limit their ability to do things they shouldn't be doing. Look, this is what this deal is. This is not some outrage of the left, as Michael says. This is about whether America works or not. The truth is, if most people believe that politicians can be bought, then most people don't believe the country works anymore. It's exactly the problem on Wall Street right now. Most people, whether you like Wall Street or you hate Wall Street, most people hate Wall Street. Frank Luntz, who is this, you know, as you know, the Republican guru, who is incredibly good at what he does, notwithstanding his personal attributes. Um, <laughs> but he's really smart. He really is. And he tells, he has told Republicans, do not defend capitalism, because capitalism is a word that's very unpopular now. I'm thinking to myself, what? I thought capitalism was the core of this country. So we're in trouble in this country, and we're in trouble in two ways. First, people don't believe the business sector, the financial sector, which they often conflate with the business sector, which is not fair, but that's what they think. They don't think it's fair, and they don't think they can succeed, and it doesn't work for them anymore, and they don't think the political structure works for them anymore. And the third thing is they don't believe the media works for them anymore. So if you get a country, no matter whether you want a conservative country or a liberal country, and most people don't believe the country works, and the system is gamed against them, you don't have a country anymore. We are facing a lot of trouble. Because the, uh, whatever you want to say, but we can argue back and forth about free speech and all this stuff. But if one guy can write a $5 million check and has a, have his r wife run, write one the next week, what about all the millions of people that are going to vote in that primary? You think they believe that this primary result is something that came about because they voted? I don't think so. I think it's a huge problem. That's what we're really facing here. Does the Democratic Party have a future? Yeah, I suspect so, probably, in some form or another. There are things that a party can do that the PACs can't do. Uh, but the PACs are pretty good. And, and sooner, the next thing that's going to happen is probably Rove, because he's the most experienced guy running one of these things, is going to figure out a way to get out the vote using, using PAC money. And, then he's, and, and the Democrats have actually done this. Uh, Harold Lickey's put together a group called Catalyst, which um, was essentially, I, I, the idea was to duplicate the list of voters for the Democratic National Committee, mm -hmm. which is, you know, 60, 70 million people on it. And then he wanted to sell that directly to the candidates. So I think parties will exist in the future, but they will, uh, they will morph uh, into a variety of things. I just do want to agree with one thing that Michael said. What you guys need is really good lawyers. Because <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. What is really a problem here is corporations, and some of them have already gotten caught doing this, will make mistakes. Some of them will be well-intended actions that turn out to be big problems and big mistakes. And when you make a mistake like that, well, I don't care what your corporation is. You do not want to end up on the second page of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal being sued by the Attorney General or the Justice Department or the FEC. That is, nobody wants that, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. So you, you're going to hear later in this from some really wonderful lawyers that I had the uh, luck to hear in Washington when we did this. This stuff matters a lot. And if, I, 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 most of the clients of McKenna Law that I work with, I tell them not to give money to politicians, political groups. But if you feel like strongly that you have to, then try to give to both sides if you can. Because from a practical point of view, the politicians may not understand your industry, but they do understand campaign finance reports, and we read them regularly. <laughs> uh, and when, when it's just yep. really hard to get an appointment with somebody of either party when you've just given a ton of money to make sure that everybody knew that they you know, had a mistress back in 1946 or whatever it was. And people never, ever, ever forget that in politics. Uh, and so if you're going to play this game, it is a very, very rough game. You have to make sure that, you, A, your corporate interest, interests are defended in the long term, not just the short term, because you don't know that the minority senator that you're trying to kick out in Minnesota or whoever is not going to end up chairing the committee that's your mm -hmm. committee of reference uh, six mm -hmm. weeks, six years later. And then you're screwed. Then what do you do? <laughs> So, and, and Washington, almost everybody in this room could tell a story, either in the state legislature or in the federal legislature, of something like that happening to them. So I say don't give money to either side. If you have to give money to a side, 
uh, to one side, just be sure you have some really smart people like Stefan or some of these guys uh, with you because there are a lot of very complicated rules, and if you run afoul of them, that is not going to help your customer base. It's a base. long day. Governor Dean, Dean I, I take your point about, uh, about uh, capped com campaign contributions com creating a consensus within, within a party organization. I mean, if you, if, if, if you talk to any co member of Congress, uh, they will always uh, hold themselves a little bit over anybody in statewide office because uh, the, the, their their caps are lower and you have to create a a, a better book of, of of contributors. I mean, ask Buddy Darden here. Uh, my my question is first to you and then then to Mr. Steele is is Newt Gingrich an anomaly or is he going to become the rule? Is insurgency? I mean, we've had we've had we have a a a party establishment candidate in Mitt Romney. Being challenged by an insurgent Republican is—is is this? Can we expect the same thing to happen eventually on the Democratic side? Is this going to kind of will this will this do away with that that consensus? Yeah, I, I don't think that's anything new. It's 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 new in the Republican side. I have to say, <clears throat> I've never seen a Republican primary like this before in my life. Uh, they're usually much better disciplined and much better organized than the Democrats. Um, but the Democrats always have insurgents. I mean, going back, going back to Gary Hart. Um, and there have been some in, on the Republican side. <laughs> some guy named Dean? Yeah, Howard <laughs> Dean certainly was. Um, so there are always insurgents, and there have been insurgents on the Republican side, Pat Buchanan. Uh, well, we but, they've, but they've never had the cash. Well, that's part of it. But the other problem is that the, you know this is a, there's a lot of turmoil in this country right now, and that means there's a lot of turmoil in virtually every institution in the country, and the Republican Party is not an exception. If we didn't have an incumbent, we'd have a huge uh, multiple pr pr primary fight as well. Um, so uh, I think it's a sign of the times that the insurgents are doing better. I think the, the, the notion of an insurgent is not new in America. That's been going on for our whole history. But I think it's a sign of the times that the insurgents are doing as well as they are, because people are really upset, really unsettled. They don't trust, quote, any establishment, whether it's in politics or some other area. Um, and that's what you're seeing. I think that's what motiv motivating Gingrich's campaign. Gingrich is a very skillful politician. I know him pretty well, because we debated each other a lot. And, I was chair of the NGA when he first got to be speaker. When I my, and I will fondly say he was insufferable at the time, <laughs> um, but but we get we get along well. I, I like him because he's a big ideas guy, and I think we could use some big ideas. Although as most people who work with Newt say he's got nine big guys, ideas a, a day, and eight of them make no sense at all. Um, but he is he's a very uh, and he does work well across the aisle. That's most things something don't most people don't believe that it's absolutely true. He and Clinton got along really quite well, and this is why Clinton was, I think, in my view, a successful president. Um, so uh, I think it's mostly a function of the difficulty of the times and the anger of the population that you're seeing successful insurgencies. Now, I, again, I, I would if I had to make a bet, I'd bet on Romney, still. Um, but Newt has certainly taken him as far as he can. If Newt wins Florida, which is possible, then I think uh, anything could happen. Yeah, I, I'd agree with uh, that. I, I'd happen to like insurgencies, um, particularly within the GOP, because it's long overdue. Uh, they, the party, in my estimation, is one of the reasons why I ran for chairman, um, had become insufferable at the grassroots level. Uh, it had become top-heavy. Uh, centralized out of Washington. So the goal initially in coming in, it was to, as I like to call it, turn the elephant, uh, to get it first to look at itself and recognize where it had, where big government republicanism had ticked off the base. A lot of folks look at Tea Party, for example, talk about insurgency. Tea Party began long before 2008, 2009, well, 2009. It started in 2005. Uh, it goes back to uh, decisions that were made in the in the first uh, Bush term that simmered within the base, the rank and file of the base, and that ultimately exploded. We saw those explosions in 2006, where uh, a lot of uh, candidates um, uh, got their clocks cleaned uh, because the base stayed home or outright uh, attacked in some cases. Uh, that continued into 2008. So this this insurgency for the GOP is is uh, something that has been bubbling beneath the surface and has is, is finding its form uh, through candidacies um, that um, we saw this past November, for example, in a number of states. If you, we can talk about Delaware, we can talk about Utah, uh, Bob Bennett's. Uh, 
uh, unfortunate route in the uh, primary that out, out there, um, where uh, the grassroots are taking a greater claim, staking a greater claim in the process, which they hadn't up to now. I mean, Howard's right in the GOP was sort of, okay, you're next, all right, we'll wait. I'm voting for him, okay, I'll go vote for him. Uh, and that's not the way this is getting played out, and I think it's a beautiful thing, quite frankly. Um, I think that um, when we sat down and looked at uh, the charge we received from the 2008 convention delegates to remap the 2012 primary process, um, one of the goals was to create a process in which this thing had two faces to it, or two, uh, two fronts. One was um, to extend the process uh, so that we did not have a nominee at the end of January or the end of February. Uh, and two, uh, to allow uh, other candidates the opportunity to make their case. One of the big complaints that states that weren't Ohio, Florida, New York, uh, California had was we don't get to play. You know, all you big dogs make the decisions. You get to eat, you know, the biggest morsels and we're left with, you know, okay, we just, it's pro forma. And so there was a lot of consternation among the states, uh, particularly over, as you can imagine, Iowa going first. You know, it's a caucus for God's sake. It's not even real voting, as one quote that I remember fondly. Um, uh, but for me. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so you have this angst that's been that's out there in the rank and file, and you're seeing it manifest now. And I think Newt Gingrich. Um, is is a beneficiary of a long line of uh, heirs to that particular throne. Uh, now the question is whether or not he can actually ascend the throne. I think he has a very good chance in Florida, and if he, if as Howard says, he does win, uh, this thing opens up in such a way that, um, yeah, he could be looking at <laughs> late April, early May, uh, which in my view is fine, and which in the view of a lot of the base is fine. And I, st I say this very clearly because I've been on the record saying it. Mitt Romney has failed to make the case to the base still. And until he does, he's going to have to fight every inch of the way for this nomination. And it's not going to be given to him easily. Uh, and the base has legitimate concerns about him and they have legitimate concerns about Newt. Uh, and so this process is going to uh, unfold itself through their eyes. The establishment can't control this and it's frustrating the hell out of them because they just can't dictate who the outcome is going to be this time, as they had in the past. And uh, as a result of Tea Party activism, as a result of uh, corporate interests now, you have this thing, this, this salad mixed up in such a way that you really don't know what's all in it, but it, some parts of it taste good and other parts <laughs> not so much. And I think that's the way this is going to go for a bit. Okay, if we can, let's, let's open it up to some questions. I'm sure there's some out there. If, if you Who's got the first one? Come on, there's lawyers here. Yeah. I, mean, I, do, I do. If there isn't, if there isn't one. Um, uh, oh, yes, sir. What, what is the role of the press in all of this? And if you think the press is biased and will skew um, how the candidates come out? Do Do you watch what I do all day long on MSNBC? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer to that is yes. <laughs> so what is your view? There's a difference, difference of democratic. Oh, I'm sure it probably would be. I mean, I think prob I, I think a lot of Republicans feel that uh, they don't get a fair shake with the with the press, and that our candidates, whether it's a Mitt Romney or Newt Gingrich or Rick Santorum, gets filleted, uh, you know, regularly. Their sins are exacerbated and and magnified to a degree, uh, and the noise is is of such a, a caliber that um, uh, that you don't necessarily see. Uh, played out. I mean, for example, the, you know, the vetting of the the associations and the character and the uh, you know moral underpinning of these candidates, whether it's Mitt Romney and Mormonism or Newt Gingrich and his marriages, you didn't see anything close to that 
about Barack Obama in 2008. Uh, you know, as, 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 hard, as hard as folks try. He's not a Mormon and he's only been married once. What are you going to yes. do? But, <laughs> but, but you didn't have the level of scrutiny about his, his, his uh, associations, you know, with his, with his pastor and, and, and the people that he uh, had philosophical connections with. That's my only point. I mean, I don't want to relitigate that. I mean, it, it, you can't go there. But that's, again, an example of a distinction that that people are very quick to make about these about how the the two sides are treated and um, it, the press largely though uh, are instigators at the end of the day they're big instigators they like the fight they love the back and forth between uh, the candidates um, they were actually bored with the debate the other night, uh, even though it was their their request that people not <laughs> applaud and respond. Um, but they do like that tension, and they because they want something reported. It's, it's not a, a it's not a good story to to write. Uh, you know, Newt raised a million dollars today. It's a more juicy story to talk about who he got it from and what the background of that individual was. So there's all of that as well. Mr. Dean, you want to weigh in here on this one? Um, I, I actually, in the aggregate, don't think the press is biased. Obviously, Fox News is, and so is MSNBC. But when you weigh out all the press, the problem with the press is not that they're biased. The problem is they give us what we want instead of what we need. Um, you know, when Walter Cronkite and Howard K. Smith and uh, John Chancellor were anchors, they were incredibly widely respected. John Edwards Lovechild never was going to get on the evening news because it didn't have anything to do with national defense or the economy or anything else like that. And these three guys weren't going to put it on the evening news. Today, uh, it, it really has to do with a corporate takeover of the media. Not, I don't think corporations ever, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I don't believe they call up and say, don't put this story on about us. GE, I don't think, ever called uh, Williams and said, don't do that. But the problem is the news is now a profit center. And if you don't, um, if you don't make money, the news gets cut. Walter Cronkite always lost money on the CBS Evening News. CBS didn't care. They had the most prestigious anchor in America, and they could make a ton of money after they slid into Bill Cullen's Meet the Price or whatever else the next thing was after it. Today, everybody has to make money in the news. And so the old saying, and you're from the AJC, you have to have heard this phrase, if it bleeds, it leads, right? The stories that are now on the front, on the front of the evening news or on the papers or whatever are the, the juicy ones, the salacious ones, the gossip, because, you know, we like gossip. It's not an accident the National Enquirer is the largest selling newspaper by far in the United States. That is a fact. And that's who we are as human beings. We trade in gossip. The trouble is when you demean the political process by only doing that, you get a government that uh, that is based on all this nonsense that goes on and instead of trying to figure out what people actually believe. Because we mostly get bored by the, 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 the interests of, I mean, not we in this room, but a lot of people are not that interested in how the, all the different complicated foreign policy fits together and, and what the real pr problem is that caused the uh, the the collapse in 2008. So I, I think that's the principal problem with the news media. And I don't know that the news media can be resurrected. Uh, I think it will be ultimately, but in some form that doesn't look anything like it. Uh, when my son is my age, I doubt there's going to be much in the way of print newspapers except for community newspapers. Um, and there's going to be huge people get their information from John Stewart and the, and the yeah. internet. And we'd better be right about our education. I can remember being told when I was in social studies class that we're not trying to teach you what to think, we're trying to teach you how to think. Well, if that's not true, we're going to have a big problem in this country because you can get anything you want on the Internet, and mm -hmm. half of it's absolutely not true. Uh, so you have to be able to tell, you have an education that's good enough to tell the difference. So I think that democracy is going, under, going through an enormous transition, and so far, unfortunately, most of it's been bad. I, I will say one. I will say one thing. When 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 Newt Gingrich took af, took after Juan Williams uh, Monday week, <clears throat> a lot of people were appalled. I just said, "Damn, Fox News is finally part of the hated media elite. <laughs> <laughs> They've graduated." <laughs> Eric, you got a question back there? Uh, yes, for, for you, Michael. Uh huh. Right. What happens It still goes on. Uh, I, because there's no incentive the way we've designed the system for anyone to drop out. We've already shown you don't need a lot of cash 
you've got debate platforms, you've got new uh, tools available to you, as, as the governor just mentioned, uh, uh, the internet and social media networks to get your message out. Um, you don't, I mean, one of the frustrations that a lot of the folks in Iowa had was that people weren't, the campaigns weren't spending a lot of money there because they didn't have to. <laughs> Um, you got the abundance of free media because people were the, the press, as we were just discussing, was interested in the the, the cat fight, uh, and the candidates were were basically like door to door salesmen, and they 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 had their networks on the ground and that were very effective of connecting people without having to drop a lot of literature or spend. Now it didn't say they didn't do it, as as you said, when you turned on your television, there were campaign ads, but again, that didn't come from the campaign. That came from third-party sources. I mean, the upside for a campaign is resources are now freed up to do other things that um, before they would have to put on their on their uh, bottom line, you know, in terms of, of their costs. Now those dollars can be uh, can be saved, stored a little bit, uh, or used more strategically because you've got these other entities out there that are doing things that you you know, as a Chinese wall, you don't know about. So uh, I think that the way the process unfolds, unfolds right now, uh, and again, and the reason, Eric, I say that it goes on is um, Mitt right now is stuck in a 25% twilight zone. And, and he's got to find the way to give the base the assurances that he's the kind of guy that's going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and fight. And, and I said this the other night uh, when we were talking about the outcome of the debate. Great to attack Newt. That's wonderful. But the voters you're losing that Newt loses aren't going to Mitt. They're going to Rick or they're going back to neutral. So that's the problem. And that's why this thing will, will stretch out um, unless uh, he can close that deal with the base uh, in Florida, uh, or shortly after in the caucus, uh, in the series of caucus, uh, caucuses that are coming after that. It's a, it's a tough slog for him. Uh, and I don't know why, um, the base hasn't really, uh, chewed on, uh, what he's saying because on paper it was, it's all there, but there's something there that just hasn't clicked with folks. Um, and I think part of that, to be quite honest, has been the establishment in Washington that from the very beginning of this campaign uh, treated our, our, our guys and gals who are running as, as little, you know, throwaways. You know, they demeaned these individuals um, by saying, you know, that, you know, they weren't, you know, qualified or this isn't the best field and, and always looking for someone else. So if you're Mitt Romney who uh, had incredible expertise coming out of the 08 cycle into this cycle, coming up against that wall first, you know, it, it just made it extra hard for him. I yeah, think. don't think that's biased because that, I can remember when Gephardt ran. The no, I'm not saying that's biased. They called him the seven dwarfs. No, no, no. I'm and not they, saying that. I'm they, saying it's they not always, biased. They always, all the client, all, all the press always demeans. No, that's not the press. Okay. That's from inside the GOP. That's what I'm okay. saying. That, no, no, that's, well, the, that's the GOP. That everybody in Washington that's right, does that. Right, it's a Washington right. phenomenon, right. not it's, GOP or Democrat. Well, I know it's phenomenon. not, but I think, yeah. I think in this, in this particular instance, uh, given, given the lay of the land and the environment in where we're in, it had a much more damaging effect uh, on this process than it, it has in the past. Uh, because of uh, the way the, the the orientation of the GOP base. Ma'am, you in the green sweater there. So I'm wondering, is all the, the big super PAC money going to go into TV 
In the presidential campaign, it will go into big TV ads. Yeah. It's the easiest thing to do without having to build an organization, which is very expensive. So Michael made a point, and I think he was right, when he said, well, that's just one expense that the, that the campaigns aren't going to have to do. In order to run a good campaign, you've got to have really strong uh, on-the-ground operation to get out your vote, identify and get out your vote, uh, which is actually the real reason we didn't win in Iowa, because Kerry developed a better one than we had. Um, and the TV stuff, which is very, very expensive, now is essentially going to be outsourced and has been outsourced. I just want to make one comment about this TV money, though, that's very tricky, and it's going to come back and bite somebody uh, in the fall, who I'm not exactly sure yet. When you're running this kind of advertising, as Michael said, you drive, maybe Romney drives votes away from Newt, or Newt drives votes away from Romney, but there's a third place they can go. Um, and nobody really knows who's doing this advertising. We all do, because we know who's associated with what PAC, but that's not clear when you see the ads. In the fall, if, if Barack Obama has a great big PAC named who knows what, uh, People will know who it is, because there's only two candidates. We had a really interesting gubernatorial race in, in Vermont this year, where there was an open seat, and the uh, Republican was a really nice guy who was a lieutenant governor, and he ultimately lost to the Democrat by a very small margin, who came from behind it after a really difficult five-way primary. And the reason was that the RGA went in and ran tons of negative ads against the Democrat. And in Vermont, A, negative ads don't, probably are not as good as they could be, and B, uh, the, the Republican candidate had two things going for him. One, he said he wasn't going to raise taxes, and two, he was a nice guy, and everybody in Vermont knew it. They liked, he's a very likable person. All of a sudden, the RGA comes in, at, trashes the, the Democrat, and people look at those ads and think, I can't believe that our, my candidate that would do such a thing. I guess he's not a nice guy after all, and that was the end of his campaign. So it's a very different game when you're running negative ads in a multiple field, multiple candidate field, which we have now, and in a two-way field. And, the, and the, the fascinating thing is going to be to see how these huge super PACs behave in the fall when whatever they do is going to get blamed on the candidate, whether the candidate likes it or not. If I, maybe I can exactly speak right to, to that, actually, because <coughs> I think there's another component to this. You need to look at the fact that the money in the super PACs ha has fundamentally changed the political system to, to some extent. I mean, you look at December 13th or so in Iowa, Gingrich is probably up by some seven or eight points uh, in Iowa and up by two or three in New Hampshire. And and literally the, the super PAC ad buys were such that 40% for that next week, 40% of every ad that was run, not political ad, every single ad, 40% of those ads were negative ads against Newt Gingrich. Five direct mail pieces hit in Iowa every single day. Now, that had a fundamental change, and you just, all you have to do is look at the real clear politics tracking polls, and you can see that that had a real fundamental shift in, in the nature of what people who had previously been basing their opinions on things like debates and, and other issues suddenly were dramatically influenced by the money that went into the super PACs. But we have been talking, and I agree that the super PACs' initial role has certainly served to be the, this attack dog that the candidates have been able to take one step back and remove and say, I can't control that, I don't know, I wish they'd take down things that aren't accurate. They've had that ability that they never used to have. But what we need to look at, and, and this is coming solely from my reading the Washington Post yesterday, is that super PACs are now getting into the business of being shadow campaign organizations. Two separate developments are making this happen, the first of which Here's a term that you are going to hear in the future is called the super super PAC or the hybrid PAC, which is that the Federal Election Commission, through some litigation, now is in a position where it's blessing a single committee being a super PAC, also having federal hard dollar ancillary accounts with it, which actually is giving these super PACs the ability, and they are literally calling it super super PACs, but they're hybrid PACs. Those are actually, I think there's some 11 have been formed already. Uh, those are creatures that are out there. I read in the Washington Post yesterday that the uh, Winning Our Future super PAC that has been aligned with Newt Gingrich has actually announced that it is, in fact, starting this very process that you were talking of, of a grassroots party style, uh, get out the vote type of, of machinery, not just ad buying, but they are actually looking at the, the notion of becoming a shadow party and trying to replace the party committee. I personally believe 
that the um, the parties are are probably under more threat than they have ever really been uh, heretofore, if that trend that I'm reading about yesterday is actually going to continue. It's scary. It's, it, it's, if we can get to, to Mr. Labelwitz, I think you had something up there. If you, like if there is anything, that could be it. Because if both parties are terribly afraid that if they vote against something, they'll, uh, you know, they'll be in trouble in an election year. That's about it. But I don't see any substantive cooperation of any kind on any proposal, other than possibly something that gets raised by uh, the press uh, and scares the. So if you vote against it, but but, I, but the problem is historically those bills don't get to the floor because the leadership kills them, so nobody has to take a vote on something like that. So I think it's. I think we desperately need this election for the sake of the republic, and hopefully the next four years, whoever wins, or they're actually going to work together. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I don't even think that bill will see the light of day. Uh, I can almost assure you that last night, on their way back to their homes with their spouses in the car, or when they arrive there, uh, they are just like, "So what does this mean now?" I, with our stock, dear. I mean, we can't. <laughs> how do we? How does this work? I mean, really? We, we, you need to retire. You just need to retire. <laughs> so they're just not going to go there. Um, they, they, in an election year, you know. You can put these these things up, and it kind of forces you to behave a certain way. And and uh, the governor's right. You know, the speaker will kill the bill in committee, or committee chairman will. You know, oh, I don't know, it was here somewhere on my desk. I had. To, <laughs> I, let me get back to you on that. Um, so this, folks, just just get yourself a good lawyer. Uh, as as the governor said, or don't give any money, or don't get, or don't give any money. Um, in terms of what you see happening at the national level, um, I think as citizens, and I very much agree with uh, Howard on this one, uh, you're going to be very frustrated this year. And I, I don't want to be a downer about this, but our political system has become poisoned with something that I really think is going to take the people to clean it out. You saw that cleaning process uh, over the last couple of years. You've seen it this year with the Occupy Wall Street mindset coming to the fore, whether you agree or disagree with, um, uh, with where they're going. Certainly, um, their underlying angst is a legitimate one. And I think that that, more than anything else, is going to be the difference between um, you know, getting it right and, and continuing to get it wrong. And, and I just don't see anything of real substance coming out. The president's speech last night, and I had to write a commentary on it at 2 a.m., uh, but uh, my, my takeaway was he fulfilled his, his obligation under the Constitution. But there was no, there was no call to arms. There was no visionary uh, type of approach that would bring these disparate points together. Uh, and, and I think that that's missing. And, and again, I, I pushed this back to the Bush administration in 9-11 uh, and this administration in dealing with the economic crisis. The American people have yet to be asked to sacrifice. After 9-11, we were told, it's okay, go shopping. Prove, prove we're Americans. Go to the mall. Uh, and with this economic crisis, we started pointing fingers. It's their fault. You make too much money. It's Wall Street's problem. And yeah, there are those issues that, that resonate uh, as a result of bad behavior by some bad people. But there was nothing to really coalesce the right and the left in those terms, where we could actually agree in looking at this problem, what the problem was. And until we're able to do that, until a leader is able to do that, you're going to see and feel this tension. Uh, and it's going to be played out in our electoral process. And I think it's going to be a bumpy ride. Stefan, how are we doing on time? Hey, I, all right. If we've okay. got questions, we're not going to start. All right, all right. Uh, uh, you and then Phil. Yeah, thank you, McCleskey. I just want to elevate this to a kind of a different level that we talked about. 
domestic situation on the boat and machinery there. What about our friends in Europe? Who do you think they do not want to deal with? You know, <laughs> I don't. You know, our foreign policy has really been pretty consistent over the, uh, yeah. from president to president. Um, I mean, if you really looked at the policy of the United States in almost any area, there's verbiage that's one way or the other, but pretty consistent over the last 20 or 30 years. I, I don't. I mean, the people who really think about this stuff seriously, you know, Newt would be it would scare them because he has a lot of different ideas and he comes at them very quickly, but. Uh, in, over the years, I mean, Obama's Israel policy is no different than Bush's Israel policy. The rhetoric is a lot different, but in fact, the policy isn't very different. Um, and that's really true almost in almost every area. Iran is another one. I mean, you know, I don't I don't see a difference in Obama's policy and, and George Bush's policy in in Iran. I don't really see an issue a, a difference in China. Um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric. But if you actually look at the policy, I, so I'm, my guess is I spend a lot of time abroad. I mean, I'm, I'm also affiliated with the National Democratic Institute. I do a lot of traveling and democracy building in countries that need some help. Um, and by and large, American presidents, our popularity goes up and down a lot, depending on what's going on. But the core of our foreign policy doesn't really change very much. I'm trying to think of one major reversal of foreign policy as a result. I would say, Lib Lib how about Libya? I think that, that if you're talking about Europe, that went over very well with them here. But I, I, don't, see a, I don't see a new Gingrich letting France take the lead in an operation like that. I, I think that's, that's, that's sort of a, a style over substance uh, point, you know, just in terms of, you know, we want to be the point of the spear as opposed to France or, or some other country. But I, I, I agree. I don't see, uh, I mean, I'm very grateful to see that the President Obama has been consistent in that because, to Howard's point, his rhetoric in the campaign as a candidate was vastly different. And you would think that there would have been a dramatic shift in foreign policy. But uh, the one, you know, that first uh, national security briefing has a way of humbling exactly uh, uh, a candidate who is now president. Yeah, I would I'd go so far <laughs> as to say that even Newt, should he be president, it would be absolutely, uh, it would absolutely be very humble style over substance. I think once you get that security briefing and you find out that your limit, your options are a lot more constricted than you thought they were. Ideology kind of has to get goes out apart. the window, and you saw that. You saw that on Gitmo. You saw that on um, uh, uh, you know Afghanistan, Iran, uh, and and Israel the same way. I mean, so I think you know running for president is not the same as being president, and the the the, the White House, the Oval Office in particular, has a sobering effect. Uh, on on uh, a president when it comes to national security, because then you're playing for all the marbles, and it's not just it's not just uh, you know some political squabble. And, and I think that I think we've seen that consistently between um, the presidents. Phil in the back. Yeah, let me ask a question, Stefan. Uh, See you. Uh, well, the, it would be you mean, cre you meant federal creating contributions, not right, hard accounts. Not, I'm not talking about public financing. Right. I'm talking about having a, a what's called a hard dollar account, or it's basically money that you are allowed under the Federal Election Commission regulations to use for direct federal election type of activity. So we're not talking about public finance. We're talking about the super PACs, which heretofore have had very large dollar contributions from individuals, contributions from unions and corporations, none of which are allowed to give money to parties or to candidates directly or to coordinate with them, that now you're going to start seeing these groups that were created to take in what's called soft money now are actually going to be a mixture. And, and as I was saying, even without that, you're seeing these super PACs now actually starting to organize as shadow parties to actually identify lists do get out the vote activity, do sort of generic party activities that traditionally were the realm of, of the national parties. And what, interestingly, and probably ironically, certainly with a great deal of humor, you can see happening. I mean, I remember joking with uh, my legal counsel about this, was that, well, we just, you know, turn the RNC into a corporation. 
<laughs> because because that that's that, I mean for both parties. I mean if if this is the landscape, uh, and certainly if what Stefan is saying uh, becomes the next deliberation of this landscape, um, the the both political parties which are not corporate structures um, uh, will have to look at making themselves corporations to compete because if that door gets opened and you know even though those corporations are going to be subject those super super PACs will be subject to the same limitations in in terms of dollars raised um, the juxtaposition of one to the other you know super PAC and super super PAC being linked that turn the lights out Right. Um, I, I, it depends. If there's a Republican majority in, in both houses and uh, and the White House, I, I think it's gone. I think it'll be undone in the name of budget savings, even though it's a pretty minimal item. But yeah, I do see public financing die. Most people aren't using public. The serious candidates are not using public financing. I mean, Barack Obama had that option. He, he you know, as a candidate in the, in the early stages of against Hillary, he was all about public financing until he looked at his bank account and said, whoa, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm no, no, to tell you, I we should, won't do I that. I shouldn't say this, but I also uh, have the distinction of pioneering another uh, aspect. I was the first candidate to turn down public financing. Yeah, you were. But we raised all our money from small donors. And but. that goes, yeah, that, but that goes back to the point I was making before. He changed, his campaign changed the way right. in which a candidate could operate when they're up against an institutional process that has its own mechanisms and rules. He found a way outside that system. And what you see evolving, and this is important for all of you to note, uh, if you don't have a takeaway, I, I think this would be it, is that you're a part of now a system that is changing and it doesn't know what it's changing into. And you've got these third party actors that are, are defining where you're standing. And then that could change tomorrow, like we just noted, a super, super PAC. Uh, so, you know, the candidates, uh, I think are going to be as as open as they can to getting resources, however and wherever they can, uh, to win their campaigns. One last question, uh, Jason in the back. You. Well, since I wrote the rule, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we need to be clear here. Florida is not a winner-take-all state under the rules of the RNC uh, when they have their primary next Tuesday. It is a proportional state because they broke the rules. They are, they are a winner-take-all with 199 delegates. We have two, we have a rule and we have a, a penalty rule and we have a, a process rule. The process rule was if you move your, if you're a winner take all state and you move your primary up before April 1st, those delegates will be apportioned proportionally among the candidates. Rule 16 is the penalty for doing that, which is you lose half your delegates. So 100 becomes 50. And that 50 is now apportioned on the night of the election. Now, that apportionment doesn't take place until you get to the convention. You know, that's an that's a a ministerial function that occurs when, when they're tallying up uh, who has what. You know, so for all the bells and whistles tonight, uh, next week and, and leading up to next week, you hear people talking about, you know, Florida's winner take all. No, it's not. It's not a winner take all because they are in violation of Rule 15, which was the rule we, we put in place, working, by the way, with the Democratic National Committee. Tim Kaine and I worked very closely uh, on this process because there were aspects of their electoral process that we liked, and this, this was one of them, uh, proportionality. Uh, and there were aspects of our process that they liked, which was the winner-take-all. 
which was interesting that, um, you know, they saw what we were doing and had angst about the fact that they had such an open primary. We saw what they were doing and had angst because ours was so closed. So we tried to find this sort of this middle ground. Um, so I think it's a great process and I think it gives every candidate a chance to fight, which is what this should be about. Um, it should not be decided because you have the most money. It should not be decided because everyone in Washington thinks you are the go-to person. It should be decided by the base, and the process should be allowed to flow itself out uh, as long as possible. Yeah, let me just say one thing about the first four states, not, which do not include Florida. I was much tougher than this year. First of all, we limited debates um, by agreement. And if it, was, if it wasn't a sanctioned debate, nobody had to participate. I think one of the things that's really hurt the Republicans this year is these 25 debates, which end up looking ridiculous at some point, especially when people are – I mean, the, the, what Mitt said, I pledge to, vo to uh, veto the DREAM Act when it gets to my desk, I think he's going to have a tough uphill slog in the Hispanic community if he doesn't get to 40, and I think there's no chance of that. And they'll try, but that ad will be up. Him, him saying that will be up all over the place. So these debates force you to go to, out to a place where the average voter is not, first of all. And you have 25. You've got to have some, but 25 of them is a disaster for anybody, either party, because we, of course, do, the, do some variation of that on, the, on the, our side. The big thing is... Uh, maybe states, you know, obviously Florida feels that they have some God-given right to have a big influence on the process. My, our argument is they already do because they're so big. So in the Democratic side, Iowa and New Hampshire are traditionally first. The politics is such as that you can't stop that. But from the, our side, we're a party that is incredibly rainbow. And so for us to nominate a candidate if they win the first two, in states that are 95 and 96 percent white, when for a huge proportion of our voters are Asian American, African American, Latino, and American Indian, is insane. And so we, what we did when I was chairman is we moved Nevada and South Carolina up first. So at least on the Democratic side, African Americans in South Carolina would have a big say, and Nevada actually has the second highest percentage of Asian Americans and a big Latino population, which is growing fast, and American Indians. So that we would have all the states, uh, all the various components, uh, major components of the Democratic Party, have a chance early. The other problem was regionality. We wanted a western state. We wanted a southern state. We don't do so well in those regions, and we haven't. And if you don't go to the regions, how you, uh, regions, how are you going to expect to do well in them? The third, the, the third piece was the small state. It is critical, I think, to have small states first. Because it's the only, as Michael says, otherwise the guy with the most or the gal with the most money wins, in Hillary's case. And the problem is, I really do think in a process like this, having done it myself, which is an awful process. On the other hand, I think it's a very good process, because if you're not tough enough to get through the process, then you shouldn't be sitting opposite the table when Vladimir Putin wants Alaska back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which if Governor Palin stays there, we might be able to make a deal. There. <laughs> but... But... Um, but it's the only chance that you get a whole bunch of different kinds of Americans to look a candidate in the eye, shake their hand, and find out what they're about in small living rooms. And I think that's essential. I think if you can buy your personality on television, you can elect anybody. You don't know what they're like. But when they're in those living rooms in a small state like Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and, and Nevada, people get to know you. And the grassroots words are almost more important than the ads. And so it, this, we're all complaining about how broken the process is. There are some very, very good things in this process that don't look so good to lay people. Um, I'm, we're one of the last states with two-year terms in, in Vermont. I'm fighting very hard to keep the two-year term because I've been to all the other states, and I see how much better it is. The voters hate it. They want a four-year term. They don't want to listen to those ads any more than they have to. But Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that taxes are the price we pay for living in civilization. Elections are the price we pay for living in a real democracy. And we want to remember that when we change around this process uh, any more than we have to. Because it, it, that is really what causes people to believe that this, this incredible country that we have works for everybody. That's a nice last word, I think. Yep. Uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A pleasure.